Welcome to Vision Chats at Johns Hopkins University, where the only thing that matters in the next hour is the future. Before we start talking about the future, um, it is uh, important for us to acknowledge the crisis that's happening today and the impact that uh, uh, it, it is having on um, uh, humanity and on people in general. Um, 193 days have passed since the first reported case of COVID-19 in the world on November 17th. 128 days um, have passed since the first reported case of COVID-19 in the United States. And as of today, according to Johns Hopkins University, 5.7 million cases have been reported, uh, cases of COVID-19, and unfortunately close to 356,000 deaths worldwide. <laughs> In the United States, close to 1.7 million cases have been reported and over 100,000 people have lost their lives um, in the United States. Uh, with that, of course, also, we are very pleased to know that over 400,000 people have recovered uh, from COVID-19. Um, so before we talk about the economic crisis and the impact on higher education and in the economy and employment, um, it is important that we acknowledge the uh, devastating impact this is having on people's lives um, and health. Of course, there is an economic impact Unemployment um, is has surpassed 15% uh, and close to 40 million uh, people have filed for uh, an employment just in the, uh, the, the or since COVID-19. Um, the GDP has retracted uh, by about 5%. Yes, we are seeing the stock market and the housing market still holding steady, but we are certainly witnessing budget cuts in um, almost every sector, including education and uh, uh, private and public enterprise. We are also seeing major paradigm shifts in our economy and in various sectors. Online learning is taken over um, as a tool to address some of these the, the issues now. And the question is, what will happen in the future? With me to talk about all of these things today is a person who I've admired for a long time. And I often say in close circles that when I grow up, I want to be like <laughs> Paul LeBlanc. Um, uh, he's the president of Southern New Hampshire University. Um, and uh, he's known for having pioneered online learning, one of the early ones. Um, uh, and, and under his leadership, Southern New Hampshire University has grown from 2,800 students to over 135,000 learners and um, is the largest nonprofit provider of online higher education in the country. The university was number 12 on Fast Company Magazine's uh, world fi world's 50 most innovative companies uh, list and was the only university included. Forbes magazine has listed him as one of its 15 classroom revolutionaries and one of the most influential people in higher education. I am truly honored to have you with me today to for this conversation, for this vision chat uh, today, Paul. Um, so much has uh, been written about uh, what's happening in the paradigm shifts that are happening in um, automation and world of work and online learning and higher education. I think in universities for the last 10 years, at least, we have heard all of these things, but we weren't listening. Um, and I believe we are listening today, right? Um, I know you sit on the AM, uh, ACE task force on testing and reopening campuses. So let's start there. What, what is going to happen um, in the near uh, future um, and in the long term to universities and colleges? People are dying to know. Well, first of all, Brooke, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a mutual admiration society. We've met years ago and I followed your work and um, just love what you do and how you think about the work. And really, I want to come back some point in this conversation to a conversation I had with my daughter and son-in-law who are both academics who are starting their careers. So we had a conversation and the question we asked ourselves was, what is education for? Like, what does it mean to have a college education? And, I, and, and uh, let's come back to that later. Let me go to your question because it's a very practical one, which is what's going to happen in September? And Here's what we know. Something like two thirds to three quarters of colleges hope to open. They want to open. It's existentially important that they open, right? They're, so there will be schools who may actually go out of business if they can't figure this out. There will be communities that will be 
existentially threatened if the school that is the economic anchor of those communities is not there in September. Whole businesses will go away. So the pressure is enormous. And our students desperately want to be back. Now look at there are certainly very nervous parents and very nervous students who might be relieved if we didn't open and we could do online. But all the pressure we're seeing is how do we open? If you have as a prerequisite of opening the availability of testing that is really accurate, really cheap, and uh, really fast, like you know, uh, their president just said, that's kind of my starting point. You won't have that. That's not going to be. It. There's no reason to think that that will be available to us. Um, so what uh, what we're talking about at the American Council of Education is to say, let's recognize that at least as matters stand today, that's not likely to be the case. And how do you have to think about this if you reopen? Well, you have to continue to honor what we know are good public health standards. So social distancing, hand washing, right? Um, all the things that, that we're sort of being urged to do and that we know work. Like these are not theories, this has worked. So you're gonna have to think about that. And to do that on a college campus, devilishly hard, right? We are designed to bring people together. And now we're being told, figure out how to do that, but at a distance. So it's a math problem. Like how many classrooms will I need? High flex classes is kind of the buzzword these days, you know, cycling people through. Um, so, but public health, you will need sufficient testing to be able to test somebody who's showing symptoms. And if they test positive, you will need sufficient testing to look at those people who they've been in contact with. There is some interested, interesting conversations around what are called pool testing. So if I take, for example, if I bring back as some schools are thinking about bringing their football teams back in a couple of weeks for preseason, they wouldn't necessarily test the whole team. They might test 10 people, coaches, players, et cetera. And if no one in the 10 it's, has a test positive, it's statistically likely that no one is infected. So it's a way of not using up all your testing capacity in, in the expense of that, et cetera. Um, then I think, you know, app, so public health measures, sufficient testing. And then the other thing you have to do is think really hard about how you protect at-risk populations. And that's obviously faculty and staff more than students. As one public health expert said, who has a son going off to college, if my kid gets it, statistically, he'll be okay. And it's likely he may not even know. If I get it, I'm gonna be pretty sick. If I bring it home to my father, my son's grandfather, he's going to the hospital. Like statistically, we know that. Lots of edge cases, lots of exceptions. Um, here's the thing we almost certainly know, no one's going to reopen their campus and not have cases. So you have to be prepared for that. The last thing I would say, and I think it's in this, I think it's likely the sta statement that's going out from ACs in draft form is that we really need to be prepared for additional demands on counseling, culturally informed counseling, handling bias incidents. We've seen an increase in bias incidents against Asian Americans and immigrants. Like be prepared for all of that noisiness, particularly in a, decise, a decided, excuse me, a divided country going into an election season. This is gonna be a very challenging fall for the country anyway. So, so I think you'll see a lot of places try to get it right. And I think it's gonna be messy. And it, no version of it is going to look like normal college. Right. It's, it's, it, we're talking, people are talking about shields around their faculty, face shields for their students, mask wearing as mandatory. And, and then you take the most social human beings known to, to our planet and say, by the way, no more social gathering in the dorms, no Friday night parties, right? Like that's a tall order. Yeah, that, that it makes me think of the article that was just published about what's happening in education in uh, Korea and what they're doing. And um, the, so that was the example that they were showing is uh, partitions, glass partitions and uh, masks for all students. And as I was reading that article and seeing, seeing pictures, one thing that struck me is that students looked miserable. Like you couldn't see happiness on joy on people's faces. Certainly there are masks on their mouths, so you can't see smiles anyways, but yeah. you can't get that, uh, uh, that era. I, I, I'm, I really want to dig into the online education with you, but I, uh, I'm curious as we're thinking about reopening and if even, even if we're able to do it, how do we handle the residential experience? It, it strikes me that the classroom is one of the challenges, but the biggest challenge is housing these students, it's housing and dining. 
Yeah. Um, it's it's essentially like I, I keep thinking of a of a cruise line <laughs> and putting all these kids and all these students uh, on it. And um, um, I, I I don't know. I, I think that that's where I get challenged. I feel like we can probably find workarounds almost everything else um, on the campus experience. Yeah. And when I get to dorm rooms, I don't even know if parents would feel comfortable sending their kids to uh, to live in a, in a, in a residence residence hall. Um, given the context. And, yeah, and I think for it, it plays out in a number of interesting ways. So at Johns Hopkins, where you are, people come and go off that campus all the time. Right. Now, in our meetings at ACE, we were talking to a president of a, a small rural college in which his students go almost nowhere and their town is very small. So I think all colleges are going to have to think about local context. So it's it's not far-fetched to think that he could get to a place where he tests everyone coming in and they kind of agree that they're going to stay in that community and in that town and as long as there are no outbreaks in that town they're pretty safe his problem of course is that if he has an outbreak in a dorm you describe overnight they could overwhelm the healthcare system in that small town they could debilitate it there are only a handful of icu beds what happens if they have to put 60 kids and staff faculty and community members into icu units so everyone's decision making is going to be contextualized in interesting ways and it, you could very well see in the same community one school open and one school's close mm -hmm. because their resource so hopkins has you know amazing medical resources scientific resources so i think of you as closer to being something like uc san diego where you see one of the most aggressive approaches to a reopening right massive testing contact tracing using platforms like the ones used in South Korea, really harnessing technology, two medical centers, right? They can bring a lot to bear. Um, but a school down the street may make a very different decision. And what we don't know, and I think you've touched upon it, we don't know how many parents will say, I'll take that chance. We don't know how many students will say, I'll take that chance. And I was speaking to a member of the faculty at a very, one of the elite top five law schools in the country who said to me, I don't care what the law school administration says. We've talked to, as a faculty, we're not coming back, <laughs> right? Yeah. And if you take a look at a lot of schools, I don't know what it is at John Hopkins for, I don't know if you guys have sort of looked at this data, but how many of your faculty are 65 and over? Yeah. Probably a pretty good portion. Yeah. Yeah, we have, and there are, there are, I mean, there are a number of challenges that, um, that our faculty are, are, um, uh, are facing, and you're, you're absolutely right uh, uh, about that. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm challenged by so many of the, the concepts that, that are around uh, just trying to come back to uh, residential experience, uh, campus experience as we know it. And um, it sounds like, I mean, what you're saying is context is going to uh, matter quite a bit. Um, I'm uh, trying to think is like, we are at a an inflection point now um, around the issue, the question of is college worth it? And it's a question that I know we've talked about and we've written about and we've uh, read about for uh, uh, at least a couple of decades now because the cost of ed higher education continues to increase. But it seemed like the power was always on the, on the side of the university. Yeah. Um, does it feel like now we're at a tipping point? Um, and I want to offer some context for that question. So one of the things that I've been doing for the last couple of months uh, since COVID-19 broke out um, is hold Zoom uh, meetings with uh, college students and with high school seniors from all around the country just to try to understand how they're experiencing this so that I don't make too many assumptions about what will happen in the future. And what surprised me is that the high school seniors, and I spoke with their families too, is that they are seriously thinking about possibly not coming this fall um, or this year. Like, take, like they're talking about gap years. They're talking about maybe I'll just go to the community college next door. Essentially, the question is, why would I go and spend all of this money uh, to just have classes on Zoom? So that's one of the things that, that has come up a lot. This is, you know, like for, these are students from all around the country. So this could be your students, mine, anybody else, and it, and it's a lot of high school seniors who are coming up. Coming up. And uh, the second thing that uh, struck me is that the parents who are now for the first time seeing what students are learning, you know, like because they're seeing the students interacting with their learning yeah. at home, 
<laughs> I think I've heard this from a couple of parents who said, that's what I'm paying for. Um, I think they're realizing how antiquated higher education still is. You know, and I'm being critical of my own industry and yours. So, um, so we are, are we now at a, um, um, at a tipping point where actually the power is shifting back to the consumer, to, to the students, um, and they might actually really put us in a position where, um, we're, um, we're gonna have to either transform or, or go away. So I, is so where are we now on that question of is college yeah. worth it and what will students mm -hmm. and parents decide to do? So, you know, with you and I and all the data shows that college is absolutely worth it, right? Yeah. In the last recession, the unemployment rate for people with college degrees was less than half of what it was for people with only high school degrees. And we know the lifetime earnings well, not as great as it once was, are still significantly better. So it's a great investment, it makes sense. Um, of course, the choice of college and the choice of major makes that investment go up or down. So if you're taking on a ton of debt in order to be an elementary school teacher, we need amazing elementary school teachers, but we don't, we shouldn't be carrying lifetime debilitating debt for what they'll ever make, right? So, so a lot of questions when you start to unpack the value proposition. But here's what I think is so interesting about the current time. I think it shocked institutions to realize that when they charge $50,000 in a private institution, I'll just pick an arbitrary number, yeah. that the thing that people are willing to pay a lot for is everything that isn't the academic program. It's the whole experience of this coming yeah. of age and in an intentional community in which I get to figure out who I am, like your world, right? The sort of designing their life questions, yeah. where I get to be in, reinvent myself out from under my parents, apply my independence, travel yeah. abroad, volunteer in a local organization, find out that I really, really, you know, I'm good at X and bad yeah. at Y. Like, but, they're they're sure to value. but the degree program, they want it to be good enough. And I'm going to evoke Clay Christensen, my old friend, and passed yeah. away last year and who was on my board for many years. Two jobs to be done. Give me an education that allows me to make good money and have a decent job. Yeah. They mostly give us the benefit of the doubt on that. They don't even ask a lot of questions, really. Some reassurance. And give me this amazing experience. And if you look at institutions, they, they think the most important thing they do is the first job. And it's really important. And I think they don't fully realize that the job that people are willing to pay a lot of money for is the second job which is this amazing coming of age experience. So when we've seen kids go home and be asked to pay full tuition, they're like, mm -mm, I don't pay full tuition for this, the academic piece. I pay full tuition for the whole thing. And I think even a lot of the, well, I'm not, you know, this isn't the same. It's like, of course it's not the same, yeah. right? You're not having that experience of being in the dorm, falling in love, trying out for the JV field hockey team, going to Florence for a semester. So, so, we're getting a real lesson in what the market tells us is valuable to them. So it's, I would say yes to your question, a college degree is still very valuable, but if you separate the degree from the coming of age, there is a reason why online education is less money and it's not because it's worse. Actually the best online is every bit as good and many times better. It's because it's only the education and it's not everything else. And I think that's a shock to a lot of institutions. Yeah. The reality is the only ones who are going to get away with charging full freight in the fall if they're online yeah. are the ones that have a third job. I mentioned two jobs, right? I said there is a job that is about getting a degree. There is a job that is about coming of age. But there is a set of schools that do a third job, which is status elite institutions that give me a value-added network when I graduate and are a very strong signal to the world that I'm smart. So there's a lot of value from a Princeton degree that comes with the acceptance letter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. there will be students who say, I'll take a year at full tuition, even if it's online and I'm not getting coming of age because I hope I get at least the next three years, subsequent three years. And at the end, I'm still getting the same Princeton graduate. When, when does that start to depreciate? Um, I mean, at some point, if we keep going like this, will so the elite they stay elite? You know where it's going to depreciate and it's depreciating right now? There yeah. are a lot of schools, I think, that were bumping up against the elite category that are selective institutions. And what they're and they've drunk their own Kool-Aid on this question. And what they're <laughs> seeing are students balk and saying no. 
And there was just an article about how many students are coming off the wait list yeah. who didn't think they would get in. So I think for the Ivies, there, there are probably fewer than 25 schools that are insulated from this. Yeah. And then I think the real shock are to all those schools that believe that they're in the elite category and what the market is saying to them is maybe not so much. They're feeling it right now. That's happening right now. Yeah. You know, Paul, my, my work has all been uh, uh, about uh, the co-curricular, the outside of the classroom yeah. um, experience that provides skill development, connections, uh, self-awareness, you know, all of the things that, that you mentioned. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to know <laughs> that now it has a, a high dollar value on it. Um, is there a way to, to, uh, to reinvent that in the online world? Um, or is it, you know, so if a school goes completely online, you've been obviously pioneering in this area. Um, is there a way or how do we uh, reinvent yeah. that so that, so that students do get it, even if it's a full online experience? So it's interesting. I think, you know, we get a lot of phone calls from colleagues who are taking their institutions to online or preparing to do so in the fall if they can't reopen. And they ask a lot of questions about the academics and how to deliver academics. And I keep saying to them, you should be asking more questions about the supports and everything else that yeah. is part of being in your college community. And they're not asking a ton of questions. Your question is the question they should be asking. And I think here's what we're gonna have to accept is that there, it's impossible to fully replicate in an online environment all the richness of what it means to live and work and study and be on the Johns Hopkins campus. Mm -hmm. Because a chunk of that experience is analog. So, so if you think about it, if I step back and open the aperture, um, if you are in a digital enterprise today, you're probably thriving because people are not being allowed very much analog life. They can't go to a restaurant and eat inside. They can't go to a movie theater, right? Like these things we can't do that are quite analog. And if you're an analog business, like putting human beings in a tube, steel tube to fly them across the country, you're really struggling right now because an that analog experience is not available to you. So online institutions are doing pretty well right now because they've never tried to do a whole lot of the analog. Your question is, how can I take this piece of the analog experience, the very human experience of being in a physical campus and somehow reclaim some of that if I have to be fully online? And the phrase I would use is, the, one I, I, the phrase I just used is the one I think is most important. You can reclaim some of that. You can create some of that. So what things can you probably do? Don't think of them as, the way we do it on campus, think about the impact. So if you remember the early days, Farouk, of when people were moving their classes to online, they often to like, I'll do everything I do in a classroom and I'll just digitize it. I'll use the same PowerPoint presentations. That wasn't very good. Like we didn't were like, no, 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 you're not really harnessing online technology. You're trying to replicate what you do. So if you think about what happens on a campus like Johns Hopkins with your good work, you create a sense of belonging. So the question I would ask is not, can we do the things we do on campus? I would ask, in our, if we have to be online for the next year, how do I create a sense of belonging? Because that's really what my work, but that's the impact of my work. I create a sense of affinity, another way of putting belonging. I create a sense that of mattering. So when people say, you know, when you think about equity and the pandemic has certainly shown a very harsh light on inequity in our society, one of the things that happens to people from underserved populations, students of color, first generation, is they often arrive on a campus and feel like they don't belong there. A million signals, like you know this, the, the hard part of equity work in higher ed is not financial aid. Like that's the expensive part, but getting students to come to campus is table stakes. Like that just gets you in the game. The game is played and what happens once they arrive. So, so when you go back to your question, if you're looking at building for a traditional age student, uh, some version of the coming of age experience of Johns Hopkins campus, you're gonna have to think about what are the ways I get at the thing that impacts, not the, not the device, but the impact, belonging, mattering, a sense of growth, um, a sense of discovering who I am. How do I take this idea of, you know, um, the things that are easy on a campus and then that are hard in a digital environment. So how do I account for serendipity? How will my students meet new friends, right? Like one of the joys of being on a campus is meeting new people. How will that happen in this environment? 
that what I'm really focusing on is giving them classes online. How do I build off that, right? And I think, you know, when we look at our online students, um, they're 30 year olds with kids and jobs. They've been in the military. They tried college 10 years before, it didn't work out or life got in the way. They don't need coming of age. Like they don't need what we're talking about. They need some of it, right? They need academic support. They need career counseling. They need mental health counseling sometimes. That's kind of the base of Maslow's pyramid. But I think the question you're asking and the big challenge, and we don't have a particular answer on this, right? When we're, as we look at our traditional age campus, about 4,000 students, and we look at moving them online, we have a whole new task force stood up right now to ask these questions. Like, what do we do with our adults, our 30 year olds that will be helpful? What do our 30 year olds not ask of us that our 17 year olds will need of us and how do we get there? And that's a fascinating question. We just got a Gates grant about this. Well, I mean, you're, and you're making me think that, I mean, everything that you're talking about um, comes all the way down to the concept of community. And um, that is what it, that is the challenging part is how, it's not how do you replicate the campus community online, it's how to create, invent um, the new community uh, online. You've taken your campus from 2,800 students to 135 thousand I think um, yeah. uh, and uh, obviously they're the, 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 they're non-traditional age they're from all, all around the country and the world um, w were you able to establish that sense of community in some pockets or in or, or among all of them how how would uh, has Southern New Hampshire University been able to do that yeah, so we have a big team, probably more than 40 people, staff members who just work on community for our, again, I'm going to say traditional online, which means a 30 year old, right? So yeah. those folks are being really important right now in working with our traditional student group to look at how we, you know, what can they learn from each other? But for the, so traditionally, go back to your question, our traditional, um, our, let's let rephrase this, for our non traditional age students who are the bulk of our online learners. Um, there's lots of community. It's interesting because they may be 30. Oh, by the way, that's an average, right? So they're also 40 and 50 and 60. Um, they want to know that there's a campus that they can plug into, even if they never set foot on it. So mm -hmm. we've got students, you know, we've got thousands of students in California and Texas who watch the live streams of our campus-based teams. So the soccer team's playing. There are people in California watching the game that day. Mm -hmm. um, they want to be able to be part of, um, and it's interesting, you know, like, a 45 year old is like, I, I, you know, I never had campus experience. I want to be part of student government. And we have a student association and people, and we will fly them in to Manchester two or three times a year. And they have a real sense of voice and they bring the voice of the student into our work. Um, we certainly do affinity groups. So if you think about that sense of belonging, if I'm an accounting student, what makes me feel like an accounting student? not just a collection of accounting classes. So we have an association there. We do mentoring programs. They're, they're being, they're building, you know, they're building their own professional network into the field with our alums. We have visiting lectures. So it's really interesting the ways in which you can create robust programming that goes to your point, which is how do I have community? How do I feel something more? Um, and then there are, you know, there are honors, there's honors associations. It's like, there's a lot of the trappings, but they're rendered in digital form. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in that sense, um, I think it's really important to remember that even if you're fully online, the campus matters. It's sort of like the gravitational pull of the whole. And every year at graduation, we had 20, almost 24,000 people graduate this year and they couldn't have graduation. We do five graduation ceremonies over three days. Mm -hmm. um, they fly in from all over, even though they've never been on campus, their whole experience has been virtual. There's still something about walking across that physical yeah. stage and getting your degree in front of your family and friends that's incredibly powerful. So don't, don't you do take you commitment on the road too? I think you do that. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do, grad, we do remote graduations because you know we serve that 50% of Americans who struggle to come up with 400 bucks for an unexpected car repair. Like that's, that's yeah. who we think of our market, if you will. And a lot of them can't afford that plane fare to come to Manchester, right? They're mm -hmm. finishing their degree. They've spent their money. They're up against it. So, um, yeah. yeah. 
So can, can I share with you a couple of themes that have come up a lot in my Zoom calls with students all around the country? Um, one of them, with all due respect to the great faculty that we have in all universities, is this was a recurring theme, um, is that with the exception to some, the students are saying, I'm literally just paraphrasing what they said, is that um, faculty are terrible at online learning. <laughs> uh, and they said that, you know, like they said, like it's, um, and, you know, because I'm asking them about their, their, their experience. And you have these amazing world renowned faculty who have, you know, who do great in, in the classroom. And now they've been yeah. um, <laughs> thrown into this online world and they're doing their best. So I completely empathize. But the feedback so far early on, you know, and what I usually say is give it some time. Yeah. Uh, humans have, are, are amazing at adapting and at, at developing skills. And before we know it, we're all going to get much better at this. Uh, am I right? Uh, am I giving them just a false promise? Are we going to get better at this online learning? Uh, you've been at it now for a number of years. Um, what was it like when you all started and yeah. how did it evolve to where it is now? So, yeah, of course you're right, Farouk, because these are smart, compassionate, dedicated faculty who want to do good work in their, with their students and with their classes. However, if you look at what happened in February and March, if we were designing a national experiment on online learning, it's yeah. exactly what you wouldn't do. <laughs> you would say, all right, would you take like enormous numbers of faculty who have not decided to be online teachers, they like what they do and they're good at it, and take them and give them a huge market of students who didn't choose online, they chose classrooms, and then put them in the classroom overnight with no training and preparation, of course it's a terrible experience. That's why a lot of people are calling it remote learning. And I think, you know, in fairness, it's all over the map. Like we even, you know, with our own on campus students, we've been polling and some of them have just been gushing with praise for the way their faculty have responded. And others have saying, like, oh, this is just a lot of homework and no actual class meetings. And I'm not right. It's all over the map. So I think there's been a great deal of forgiveness for the spring. I think everyone knows this was a hastily thrown together situation that we would not have chosen. I think that goes away in the fall. So the only way we're gonna get better, to your point, is with intentionality. And that means training, support, platforms, really helping faculty and students understand what it means to, to learn and to teach in an online environment. And then wrapping around that, the other kinds of supports that are so much part of the academic experience, but faculty and students, when they think about the classroom, they're often not thinking about the tutoring center my peer tutors, uh, the writing center, the counseling center, like all of those things are extensions of the happen what happens in the nucleus of the classroom. So it's gonna go back to my earlier point, like yes, train your faculty, design the courses, take advantage of what it means to be online. Don't try to do what doesn't work very well in online, but almost as or more important, think about the whole ecosystem of learning in which a class sits doesn't sit in isolation. It's not just a faculty and a student in a classroom. It's an ecosystem, which includes other students. So how are you going to think about that? So it's a very tall order and schools that either decide not to reopen or try to reopen are forced to close, which is a very likely scenario if we see a surge again. Um, they're going to have to be much more thoughtful than they had to be or had time to be more fairly uh, back in March. Yeah, I, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing a parallel here be, uh, between the experience of faculty now and the experience of non-faculty educators. So these are the, the support staff, the uh, um, uh, counselors and academic advisors and uh, career coaches and, you know, people like that, who for, uh, for uh, a number of years now, for at least the last couple of decades, have been forced and have had to um, get their engagement game on that just turn and and what that means is uh, 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 adapt new uh, to new platforms integrate them use them uh, they have to become really really good marketers of yep. their work because the engagement with them is optional for students they don't they don't get a grade for it and uh, all of a sudden I think faculty now are that same uh, line where they have to to adapt to these same types of um, um, of measures. One of the feedback that I heard from students is that um, the faculty that they praised at doing at being really good at this are the ones that um, 
have before COVID-19 uh, been naturally engaged in social media, used other apps other than the ones provided by the university anyways. So they, they didn't just take their slides and put them on Zoom. They started integrating a bunch of technology platforms to uh, uh, enhance the student experience. And what that makes me think is that what universities of the future will have to do is um, in addition to training and all of the things that you mentioned is actually reinvent the entire technology infrastructure uh, to ensure that faculty are, are tapping into that and, and creating that enhanced experience. Um, I wonder if that's something that you've had to do at, at uh, Southern New Hampshire University and then and how you've invested in that area and what we can yeah, learn. It's huge. So um, I think you're absolutely on target, Farouk, and I think that it's a race without a finish line because the technology keeps evolving and the adaptations of technology, by, particularly by young learners, continues to evolve. So if you've ever tried to email students, you know, two weeks later, like, oh, I'm sorry, I never checked my email. They're like, who uses email? It's like so 90s, right? Um, I live <laughs> on email, they don't. Um, so we have spent tens of millions of dollars on our technology stack. And I think, you know, there are critical pieces of that. And it, what's so interesting is that we live in a regulated industry. So how you think about that, it gets really complicated. So there are things you might want to do around access or around supports that actually become privacy issues. Like everything has a flip. Even if we look at this question of reopening, how are we going to do contact tracing, right? Are you going to force students? One school says, look, at, if you come back, you have to sign an agreement that you get a flu shot. Like we don't need, we can't complicate our life with people who don't have flu shots. Like, can you ask someone to do a flu shot? Like, I don't know, is that legal? Looks up. So uh, we're, we're not in a sort of open industry that is an unregulated industry. So our life gets more complicated, but to go back to your question, you know, one of the most important things we have right now is a very robust implementation of Salesforce's CRM because our secret sauce in many ways is our advising. And our advisors, and you would love this, and I'd love you know to pull you into this conversation with us someday. But our advisors spend twenty, our academic advisors spend probably twenty percent of their time on academics and eighty percent on life coaching. Like I often say, our academic advisors are really life coaches, because to be an online learner is often to be an isolated learner. So to whom does it matter that you're actually doing this work? You know, you're you're it's ten o'clock at night. You're sitting at the dining room table. You're laboring over your stats assignment. It's hard, you haven't been in college in 10 years. And in the other room, you can hear your spouse and kids laughing at your favorite television show. Where do you wanna be right now? And it's the advisors who are the ones who like encourage and cajole and make sure you're staying on pace. All of that incredibly important human interaction is actually supported and amplified by a very powerful CRM. Like that technology is what makes us really good at the human piece. And I think when you, you know, you evoke communication or how people will engage, you know, we have teams that look at all of that. So we have teams that are looking at VR and AR, right? Some immersive learning environments. Uh, how do we do better assessments? How do you take assessment uh, from being kind of a, I would argue, almost a sort of power, a misuse of power to assessment as being a learning tool? Um, Right, so it becomes assessment becomes a welcome part of how I learn as opposed to something that I get a stick that I get the hit with. So we have to be looking at technology across the board. And I think, you know, one of the things that's a real shortcoming in our industry is that IT is often looked at as a utility. It's like, I only even talk about it if my computer doesn't work. Like what the hell's going on with our IT department? Let me call the help desk, right? And in most other industry sectors, IT has become a strategic platform, a transformation platform. And I think the most innovative universities think of their technology platforms in the way that you have vote. Um, but the bulk of universities tend to still think of it as a utility, kind of a necessary evil of what it means to live and work in this day and age. So when we really set out on this journey to think about what it means to be a digital organization, which is how we think of ourselves quite often, um, we hired the former managing partner of global technology for BCG. And he's the one who observed and said to us, you know, all the discussions at SNHU about technology are sort of like utilities, but it's actually technology that's gonna allow us to transform what we do. Like, how can we not be more strategic about this? And it really gave us a different frame of thinking for technology and the work we do. 
And right now, the thing we are doing is going through almost every single process that a student experiences with us to ask, where can it be digitally or virtually delivered, algorithmically delivered, and where should it be a human? And let's put humans in the places that matter most and that are most impactful for people. And let's use digital wherever we can to make things faster, smoother, um, cheaper, more efficient, right? I mean, the reality, Farouk, is one of your students at Johns Hopkins could probably in less than a half hour get a $500,000 mortgage online and then compare that to what it means to fill out the FAFSA and go through the financial aid process for yeah. $15,000. For $15, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, so, so we think about this question all the time. Yeah, I, I use the gym analogy a lot of of how uh, of how easy it is to uh, uh, consume the services of the gym, whether it's register for classes at the gym or or just go and use it, and and how hard, how hard sometimes it seems to uh, just select your courses on um, um, in at a school um, uh, or um, in college, or you just sort of like pick your, your experiences and sometimes you end up missing out on the most important ones. Yeah, so like when we look at, we've moved to um, a new um, admissions portal, very streamlined. It's really closer to kind of consumer grade experience. More than two thirds of our students now apply to us on their phone. Mm -hmm. right? and we want that experience to be closer to an Amazon experience mm -hmm. than you know paperwork and triplicate with all of these other forms. Um, and, and, and it's just not a place that higher ed spends a lot of time thinking about. And it's yeah. kind of remarkable, don't you think, Farouk, the degree to which students put up with really poor consumer experiences? Like in reality, I bet at Johns Hopkins, you probably can't use the phrase customer service. I know I can't, and we're pretty innovative. And if I try to use that on our traditional campus, even online, people are like, well, do we have to use that phrase? Like, Right, um, and, and we think, yeah, but why do we make it so hard to manage the transfer credit process? Why can't we have good customer service in the transfer credit process? And we get really yeah. good at it. Well, I mean, it's that and it's the value add, it's the, the, the outcomes, it's all of these things that tend to be, to create friction points with the academic culture uh, of the university because uh, we're still hanging on as a, uh, um, you know, a culture of higher education to uh, the idea of what is of the, uh, that's around the purpose of higher education. Uh, all of it, I agree with. You know what the purpose is? It's to grow minds and to uh, contribute to society. And uh, um, but at the same time, I think when when cost uh, is up uh, at, at to the points that it is now. Uh, then value proposition becomes an important question, and it is now more than ever uh, before. Um, the customer experience, satisfaction, and return on investment, which I know is also another term that uh, uh, we we uh, run uh, away from a little bit. Um, yeah. But uh, is so is this are we is this the moment where we actually feel like? Now higher education has no choice. We, we are now moving more towards those uh, uh, elements and um, uh, we're beyond just the friction point where we have to dance around it. it. It is what it is. So here's what we know for it, right? Historically, when the nation has gone through a catastrophe like this one, higher education has been reinvented. So out of the horror of the Civil War came the Morrell Act the creation of our land grant universities and arguably the public university system. Out of World War II and arguably the depression came the GI Bill and some would say the great democratization of higher education and a whole new wave of institutions that didn't exist before. Um, you could argue to a lesser event, the events of the 60s, the civil rights movement, et cetera, started to change higher ed. I don't think it's as dramatic as my two prior examples but this is a national global catastrophe and coming into it, higher ed was already broken. Like what do we, what's different today that we did not, we already knew that online education was increasingly high quality and effective and something students want. That's just borne out in the data, the numbers. Students are voting with their feet. We already knew that we were increasingly out of reach of so many students, especially if you have offer a campus experience, $1.6 trillion of debt 
there's a reason that last fall, the free college movement actually became an important national dialogue in the democratic primary, in the national dialogue, right? Like these things are not new. Um, we knew business models were broken and schools were very fragile. All of those truths have been amplified and processes have been accelerated by the pandemic. And I think even more importantly will be the scale of the recession. So in 2009, which was a very bad year, we had about seven and a half, eight million people unemployed over a two year period. And as you said in your opening, we're over 40 million people. Right. It pales, 2009 pales by comparison. So you're into the high res not gonna have a choice. It is going to look different. And then the questions will be, what are the ways that that happens? And I think the pandemic and in some ways even more forcefully, the recession will be the great forcing factor that gives us a new vision of what higher education looks like. And it doesn't have to be an impoverished vision. In fact, it could be an opportunity to address a lot that doesn't work very well in higher ed, to have bold new imaginative vision for what higher education looks like. But like all sort of cycles of destruction and rebirth, it's gonna be very painful. Right. Yeah, for a couple of years too, because we're you know we're we're looking. I mean, as I said at the beginning, we're we're looking now at a GDP or GDP re retraction of close to five percent. Uh, economists are predicting that we will be at close to a um, fifteen percent retraction, which is at the levels of uh, World War II. Uh, yeah. We've not seen seen a retraction that 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 bad since then. So. Um, um, I, I, I'm always telling my team and, 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 and people when we talk about these things is um, that the class of 2020 is certainly feeling this um, in, in a really bad way, both from just the interruption of learning and some of the traditions that, that didn't get to have this year, but also in terms of outcomes entering into um, a, a, a disrupted job market. Class 2021 um, is actually going to feel it um, in in much harder way because the economy is shifting right in front of our eyes, and it'll take a while before the new the jobs of the new economy are fully born and fleshed out, and the ones that are completely dying now are going to uh, go away. Uh, it, it will take a little bit of of time. Um, yeah, am I right about that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, for about sure. That? I mean, for Rick, if you look at the great the last recession. 65% of the jobs that went away didn't come back. Yeah. So we went back to pre-recessionary employment. It took about 10 years, it took a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. But when we did, most of that, 65% of that was driven by new jobs, new kinds of work that didn't exist in 2007. Um, there's every reason to think we will see some version of that. And in fact, we just completed a survey of 900 recently unemployed people and pretty representative demographic stretch from across the country. I just wrote about this in a Forbes article. And what they said was, you know, two thirds of them want to change industries. They're not going back. They're not going back to restaurants, hotels, tourism, or retail, because those don't feel safe anymore. So the number one area they want to go to is healthcare, despite right now the current layoffs, but those are short term, presumably. And they, and they want to go into business of some kind, some other kind of business. And interestingly, not IT at the levels that most of us would have predicted. Now, you could argue that if you're in retail and tourism, you are more people-centric. And maybe that's why healthcare appeals more than IT. I don't know. But I think to your point, um, we're going to, um, this will be a long stretch. I, I'm in the camp that doesn't think we're going to see a V-shaped recovery. I think this is going to be structural and it's going to prolong. And we have to be very careful not to talk about higher education reinvented in a monolithic way, because the needs of 18 year olds getting out of high school and wanting a residential experience on the Johns Hopkins campus looks very different than a 30 year old who got laid off from a hotel chain and is looking for a different job. And there will be people who will have the luxury of a two or four year degree. There are people who are going to need three months. Like, I, I don't have that option. I Give me something in three months, it gets me back to work. When we did this survey and we asked people, the number one thing they were focused on was skills. Like, give me skills. Give me the skill I need. Give me the skills I need to get a better job. Give me the skills I need to go back to work. And they wanted it in 17 days. Mm -hmm. That's not a degree program. <laughs> you know, you could do a pretty amazing three-week immersive deep dive in how to go from being the reservations agent at a hotel company to being a contact tracer. I think we could probably do that in three weeks of immersive deep dive learning. 
And look at, we're going to need hundreds of thousands of contact tracers. And right now I think they pay 26 bucks an hour. So a lot of people who would take that job. Mm -hmm. So, so that's going to be a kind of work colleges do, and there's going to be degree work and there's going to be online and all of them probably have to look somewhat different given the changing circumstances of the world. So in, in a lot of ways, COVID-19 has really played the role of, uh, of an accelerant to trends that we have known are coming um, uh, for a, at least 10 years, I think the last two decades. Sure. We've talked about automation for a long time. Yeah. Uh, World Economic Forum has, has uh, uh, written many reports about jobs that are dying by 2020 and 2025. I guess we just didn't know that it was going to be a pandemic that will, uh, that will do that. I think there are a lot of reports that were talking about the, um, uh, the, economy, the economic shifts that we will experience over a decade or two, but now it's all been compressed in a month or two. Um, so everything that I think is happening in a way isn't surprising, but it's just, it's surprising that it's happening so quickly. Our shift towards online learning, towards remote work, to the reinventing the way we connect. Um, so th 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 this acceleration towards change is happening faster than perhaps the capacity of human beings to be, be able to change um, uh, um, as, as quickly as the trends. But we're going there regardless. Um, what, what will be the outcome of all of that is, is, is uh, my question. Where are, 2022 is what I'm thinking about. Like at that point, I think two years would have passed. Um, a vaccine hopefully would have, uh, would have uh, been deployed worldwide. Uh, where are we in 2022? So if you, I'm a big fan of Lori Santos, who has a, one of my favorite podcasts called The Happiness Lab. She's a professor of cognitive science at Yale. And she has a couple of great podcasts dedicated to the pandemic. And she interviews a researcher, I think at the University of Chicago, who talks about that, um, you know, after these events, well, first of all, in these events, people lean into each other. So I think it's easy to be dismayed by the, protests, the reopen protests that the you know, Michigan capital of um, state, Michigan state capital, and you think, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? But the reality is we know that 75% of Americans think we should continue social distancing policies and that we should take care of each other. Like there are really good things happening right now. The New York Times reporter who covers epidemics um, in one of the most sobering podcasts of the daily, if you listen to another podcast I listen to, talked about the one thing that he takes some solace in is after catastrophes like this is when you tend to get dramatic new social policies. So it was after World War II that Europe adopted what we now know as kind of the national social safety net. It came out of something called the Widow's Fund and some other programmings, programs that were put in place because of the level of suffering, but it actually became part of the future. So will we, after this, finally have a serious conversation? We have a serious conversation. Might we finally move to national health care? Like we see what it means for poor people and the disproportionate impact of an epidemic on people of color and poor people in America. What are we talking about? Why doesn't everyone have adequate health care? Will we see something that looks like, if not free college, debt-free college? Um, will we start thinking, you know, so I think there's an opportunity to look at very big questions. And I think one of them will be, what's the future of higher ed and how does higher ed look? And there'll certainly be the future of the workplace, which has implications for commercial real estate. I know that I'm not going to take as many business trips. Like, honestly, I don't love a life on Zoom, but when we're back to some version of normal, there'll be a lot of trips where I used to get on a plane, fly to the West Coast for a two hour meeting and then grab a flight home the next day. And I think, I don't need to do that. Like, I've gotten pretty good at this. We've all gotten pretty good at this. Yeah. Um, the number one request we have in our staff before this was more remote work. I want to work, from, I want more work from home. And we just, you know, built a 1700 spot parking garage and it just finished up this fall. I'm thinking, oh my God, we probably <laughs> could have built a 600 spot parking garage for the future. Like we won't go back to the level of, of staffing yeah. we had in the workplace. We'll give people way more flexibility because our folks have demonstrated they're really productive. Now, yeah. like, we have some people with kids underfoot who are like, please, dear God, get me back to the office as soon as you can. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. But that will get fixed, right? That's going to change. Um, so I think we're going to look at a lot of what's broken. Do you know, the, you know the Institute for the Future out of Palo Alto? It's one of our favorite organizations. We do a lot of work with them. Yeah. They used to be called Xerox Park, for those of us who are old enough to remember yeah. them. 
the hotbed of innovation, John Seeley Brown and others. Yeah. And um, they have a, a, a saying that I'm really fond of, which is in times like this, things that have long been stuck get unstuck. Things that seemed unthinkable become possible and the unshakable become broken. So overnight, our world has been turned upside down. It's terribly disorienting. But there is an opportunity to look at things that have felt long broken and imagine fixing them. And there are things that may feel very stuck, which will finally get unstuck. Yeah, well said. I, uh, uh, I like that a lot. I, uh, so Paul, I'm a visionary wannabe. I, uh, I, I'm constantly trying to think about the future. And when I think of people who do this really well, uh, you're obviously at the top of that list. Early on, when you decided that online education is uh, the future for your institution, how did that come about to you? Like, what was what were the signals to you that made you think, "I'm right about this," despite all of the um, uh, the naysaying the the, uh, the that's around it in higher education at the time? Yeah. So I think back you know, to the extent that we can, any of us can recreate history very accurately. When I was a new president arriving at Marlboro in 2003, and I teach in the new president's program at Harvard from time to time, and I always say, these are all first time presidents. It's like, I know you have to be your school's biggest cheerleader out in the world. Do it, that's part of your job. Internally, you're gonna be a hard nosed poker player. And when you take a new presidency, it's like being dealt a hand in a po high stakes poker game. What do good poker players do? They know what cards to play. They play their best cards. They don't make dumb bets. They never chase an inside straight, right? Like you don't, you, there are certain things you do. I sound like an inveterate gambler. I'm not, I just like poker. But uh, so you play your cards. And when I arrived, we had it, we, you know, we were an unknown mid-tier, very local institution, um, but we had an online program. It only had 18 people in it. It was small, but they were doing good work. And I have a background in technology. And I thought I can play this card. Because I looked around and not-for-profits, as you just in, in, imp implied, they were looking down their nose at online education. But yeah. I didn't have to invent. I could go look at the world, what the for-profits were doing. And I could see that, you know, by then, they were nearing 12% of all college students. Remember, Phoenix at its, at its height was over 500,000 students, I think. It was mm -hmm. enormous. And, they were, and they, were, like, they were doing a lot of things differently. And I know this is a reflexive, you know, for-profit evil, not-for-profit good. Honestly, there are good practices and players in the for-profit world, and there's some pretty awful players and practices in the not-for-profit world. Mm -hmm. I do think that the for-profit sector is riddled with problems and has been. So they've been their own worst enemy. We could talk about that some other time. But I did look at the way they were thinking about things like, how do you, how do you change the business rules to make the processes easier for students? Not the, not the, not the academic program, don't make that easier. Like give that rigor, but why do you put people through hoops that they don't need to be? And who are they serving? And how are they thinking about that? How are they deploying technology? How do they use data? You know, we're, we're, we're super data driven, like 75 people in our data analytics team. We learn that from them. We don't, we, you know, when we have guests, other not-for-profits visit us, it's probably the one thing that blows people away after the sense of mission. Like they all comment, wow, the sense of mission here, like this place is so focused on its mission. And we're pretty disciplined about what we don't try to be. Like we can never be Johns Hopkins, right? We don't do research like you guys do. We don't do science, right? We need Johns Hopkins in the world. My students don't need Johns Hopkins. They need SNHU who understands the challenges of being 30, employed, stuck in a bad job with two kids to feed. Like that's, 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 who, right? that's what we're built for. Larry Bacow, the president of Harvard always says, you could never be Harvard. We could never be you. Like keep doing what you do. Like we can't serve who you serve and they need you. So, so I think back then I thought, you know, we could compete. Like I know where our growth opportunity is. I can see that everyone knows the demographics. We knew what the Northeast was going to look like. The one thing in our business that we know is how many kids are being born. Like I can tell you today what the market looks like 18 years from now in New England. I can, I know what the birth rate is. So I was like, this is not pretty. We better think about how do we expand our market, take what we do pretty well in this little group and really run with it. And it's, you're kind to give me credit for vision, but I think a lot of innovation is actually knitting together what's around us today. Like I think you and I could sit with the whiteboard and invent a new version of American higher education 
and we wouldn't have to invent anything. It's all out there, but it's out there in pieces and islands and places, and we could bring that together. And so much good invention is about that, right? So, yeah. Um, you, yeah. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, we could go on in this one for a long time. And no, it's, no, okay. it's, it's it's perfect. I'm agreeing with you, and I it it, it is about listening and paying attention and connecting the dots in a different way. And um, I, but I think you do that exceptionally well. In the minute that we have left, um, one image, word, or phrase that um, uh, you you can see or uh, uh, the when you think about the future. Yeah, student centered. We still have an industrial model of higher ed that puts institutions at the middle. Okay. We are gatekeepers that allow you the privilege of coming to us. And then you conform to how we want you to study. You conform to our community. You conform to the way we are. And we move you through and send you out in the world transactionally. And I think the future is going to be precision learning, student-focused learning, curated learning for students, really understanding what they need, knowing that the needs of a first-generation kid out of inner-city Baltimore who has no internet at home and shares a crowded apartment look very different from a privileged kid from suburban DC, right? And we can't just put them in a one size fits all model of our institution or of higher education. The needs of a 30 year old or 40 year old or a 50 year old or recently unemployed worker look very different than a 17 year old who's coming out of high school. Like higher education was built for in, in the industrial age. It was expanded in the industrial age and it operates on a largely standardized model of how to be in the world, that doesn't work today. And we don't accept that in other industries. When you go increasingly in the world of medicine, my favorite analogous industry, when you go into the world of medicine, you feel like what you want is personalized or precision medicine. You want to know that of the X number of kinds of breast cancer, the treatment that works for this one is not the one that works for this one. Why would you give me a one size fits all? Like understand where I am, and then tr give me what I need most. And that's a fundamental core shift in higher education. Mm -hmm. We say we're student-centered. I actually don't believe it. I think we're student-focused. It's a different thing. And you, well, you for, are the leading voice on this in many ways. Like, you, you know, we need, we need your center to be leading that conversation. We should do this together. We should. <laughs> I love that. That's a great... Hey, someone asked me about the podcast name, so I don't want to get off before we do that real quick. Lori Santos, Yale professor, her podcast is called The Happiness Lab. I feel like the president of her fan club. I talk about it all the time, The <laughs> Happiness Lab. And the one that I mentioned was The Daily, which is the New York Times podcast. And the particular one, if you're searching for it that I'm talking about, is called A Year, parentheses, or two, parentheses, living with the pandemic. It's probably six weeks old, but it's still amazing. And it's, it's sobering, but you got to stay in for the last five minutes because it's the part that will give you hope. So- Awesome. Thank you so much. I have to run off to a one o'clock meeting, but it's just a delight to be with you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of our viewers for being with us today. And um, remember, everyone, there is only one certain vision for the future. It's the one that you create. And with that, I say goodbye. Thank you, Paul. You have been amazing. And I hope we get to do this again. Oh, I would love to. My pleasure. Take, right. Stay well. Okay. We need you. <laughs> we need you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Stay healthy.